Our next speaker is Grant G. Murray, who will be speaking on us on computers and the law and the technology aspect. Mr. Murray is a graduate of the University of Toronto and of the Osgoode Hall Law School and was called to the bar in 1954. <clears throat> From 1954 to 1961, <coughs> He was in private practice in Toronto, and from 1961 to 63, he was with the Steel Company of Canada in the legal department. He then joined IBM as counsel in 1963, and in 1966, he was appointed secretary and general counsel, and later in 1972, became the vice president, general counsel, and the secretary. In his present position at IBM, he's responsible for the legal department, and also has responsibility for external relations, commercial relations, and patent operations. He's a director, and he's the immediate past president of the Canadian Business Equipment Manufacturers Association, and he's the chairman of the Conference Board Council of Public Affairs Executives. He has many other uh, associations that he's involved in, but uh, I would simply mention also that he's vice president of the Association of Canadian General Council and he's a director and he's also a member of the executive committee of the Canadian Council of the International Chamber of Commerce. We're very happy to have Mr. Grant Murray. The well-being of the person, or as has been taught so long in the law schools, the concepts of in rem and in persona. In other words, as the law developed, its primary purpose was to provide citizens with a remedy when there was some interference with their tangible property, their rights with respect to tangible property, or some injury or damage to their persons. And while there were some early exceptions to this traditional concept, for example, defamation, contracts for service, our legal system was primarily concerned with people and objects and paid relatively little attention to intangibles and abstractions. Now let me hasten to add that I have tend no criticism by this observation. These concepts were entirely appropriate to the times in which they were articulated. They were concepts which were relevant first to an agricultural and semi-feudal system and subsequently following the Industrial Revolution to a goods producing society. But the world has changed, and while these concepts have served us well, they are often less appropriate or relevant in the world today. Because even though some of us don't fully appreciate it yet, we have already entered a new age. We are, I submit, already well launched into the information age, the third wave of human civilization, as Alvin Toffler has somewhat grandiosely described it. And the, and the information age is not primarily concerned with tangible property. The information age is concerned with ideas, concepts, knowledge, theory, and above all, data, vast quantities of data. And while information can be captured on the printed page or on a cathode ray screen or as electrical impulses in an information handling system, it is an intangible commodity. It can't be touched, painted, welded, refrigerated, or melted. It can't explode or be dropped or catch on fire and cause property damage. It can't physically hurt you, but it can be moved, stored, erased, modified, and retrieved. It can be stolen. It can also be memorized, studied, analyzed, and updated, and most important of all, it can be acted upon. Indeed, in today's society, information is the basis for nearly all human activity. If it's not available to you, or if it's wrong, you may be prevented from making decisions, or you may make wrong decisions. In either case, you may sustain substantial loss. So, where tangible goods were the lifeblood of the industrial age, knowledge and data are the key ingredients of the information age. Moreover, we have moved into the information age at lightning speed. And this is due in large part to the exponential increase in knowledge itself. 
The first scientific journals made their appearance in the early 17th century. By 1750, there were ten scientific journals, and since then the number has multiplied by a factor of ten every fifty years or so. Alvin Toffler has estimated that the sum total of human knowledge was doubling every ten years by 1950 and doubling every five years by 1970. So not surprisingly, this growth of knowledge has quite literally changed the face of our economy. In 1950, some 46 percent of our gross national product was produced by services. By 1980, this figure had grown to 62 percent and is continuing to increase. And much of this growth is directly attributable to the growth in activities related to the gathering, organizing, storing, and distribution of knowledge and information. In short, the evidence is all around us that information has become a key resource in today's society and in the process has assumed gigantic importance and enormous value. So while the legal concepts surrounding property and persons are still important and still relevant in many situations, our legal system will increasingly have to take into account that information is the key resource of the third wave of civilization. If information is important, there is no question that the phenomenal developments in data processing, office systems, communications and telecommunications technology have been the driving force behind our headlong rush into the information age. With that in mind, let me take a few moments to examine the impact the technology is having on the way we use and manipulate data. Clearly, the new technologies permit us to deal with information in quantities and at speeds and at costs undreamed of even 20 years ago. It's not unusual to find computer chips or microprocessors equivalent in speed and power to the most advanced computers available in the early 60s selling today for $25 to $50. It's not easy, I know, to relate to this revolution in technology, but an analogy might serve to illustrate the progress we've made. If aircraft engineering had proceeded at the same pace as data processing technology, the Concorde would hold 10,000 passengers, travel at 100,000 kilometers an hour, and a ticket would cost less than a dollar. Because of these advances, a consumer can now buy, at a cost of three to five thousand dollars, a computer system which would have cost him well over half a million dollars just 15 years ago. So I can assure you this technological explosion is continuing unabated. Therefore, what are some of the characteristics of this, of this new technology which are relevant for our discussion this morning? First, as I have indicated, the cost of the technology continued to decline, and hence the number and variety of potential applications continues to grow. Second. Telecommunications and data processing technologies are used to operate integrated systems with very little, if any, human intervention. Very seldom are these technologies used to perform a series of discrete activities under separate operator control. Rather, the technologies are integrated to perform as total systems which automatically capture, move, store, modify, retrieve, and increasingly act upon information. <clears throat> Third, these automated information handling systems increasingly control and operate major activities in the enterprise, be they commercial, governmental, or educational. Applications such as payrolls, accounts payable and receivable, Inventory control, process control, branch banking operations, the nation's pension checks, and so on, are now commonplace. Fourth, more and more these systems are dynamic. By that I mean that the information in the system is constantly changing. Many of today's systems operate in real time, updating and processing data instantaneously 
to control operations on a day-to-day -day or minute-by-minute -minute basis. Fifth, automated information handling systems are made up of many components which must all interact and function in concert. For example, a typical communications-based information handling system comprises several hardware units, central processing units, storage devices, printers, terminals, etc. A variety of software, control programs, utility programs, application programs. It encompasses telecommunication equipment and telecommunications lines, air conditioning equipment, humidity control equipment, and finally, a power source or sources. Sixth, the users are constantly increasing the volumes of data being processed through their systems and are also regularly adding new applications. Therefore, users are constantly expanding and upgrading their systems. Sometimes they do this by adding incremental capacity to an existing system. Sometimes they install a completely different system. Frequently, they replace old systems with new systems as the technology advances. And all these changes must be accomplished with minimum interruption to the enterprise's existing workload. Seventh, the data processing and office systems industry is highly competitive, and the telecommunications industry is becoming increasingly so. Accordingly, users have a wide range of choices based on cost, function, etc. And believe me, they are certainly exercising their freedom of choice because most major systems today comprise a mix of data processing equipment from several different suppliers, a mix of programs from various sources, including programs which the user has written himself, and a mix of telecommunications equipment and services from different vendors. Eighth, these systems do fail from time to time. They are often very complex and constructed of very intricate electronic circuitry and components. They execute literally billions of computations in an average working day and operate at speeds measured in millionths of a second. Programming, which is the fuel that drives these systems, is still an art and not an exact science, and therefore programs are by no means error-free. Users often want the most advanced technology, and often they install systems which are pushing the state of the art. There can be communication outages and power interruptions. And it's not surprising, therefore, that there can be failures, including what we call intermittent failures. And indeed, when these systems fail, the complexity of the system is such that it is literally often impossible to identify what went wrong. Now, having said that, I don't want to leave the impression that these systems do not perform reliably or are not capable of satisfactorily performing the tasks for which they are used. Indeed, with today's technology, their reliability is exceptionally high. But the fact is, statistically, they will fail. And when they do fail, the potential economic loss can be substantial since major activities within an enterprise can literally be brought to a standstill. And since this is the case, the user needs to make certain economic decisions as to how fail-safe he wants his system to be. Is he willing to pay to duplex a system? Should he have a manual backup system? How much redundancy and security should he have in his system? Many additional safeguards can be incorporated in today's systems at extra cost, but only the user can determine how much he is willing to pay to achieve an added measure of protection. In any event, despite some of the shortcomings, enterprises are willing to make full use of the technology to capitalize on the substantial benefits it offers and at the same time to accept many of the risks involved. And as you will see, all these characteristics become very germane and relevant 
in assessing the current legal environment as it relates to today's automated information handling systems. They also give rise to some of the public policy questions which will have to be addressed. So how does all this relate to our current legal environment? Clearly, in many situations, the current jurisprudence is still relevant in dealing with the information age and in dealing with information technology. However, due to the intangible nature of information and the characteristics of information handling technology, there are also many situations in which it is difficult to adequately adapt our present jurisprudence and also situations in which it just isn't suitable at all. In many situations, there is a decided lack of precedent to guide us in advising clients. Therefore, I would like to take a few minutes now to share with you some thoughts which stem from my own experience and which may be of some practical assistance to you in your own practices. And first, let's look at contracts. To begin with, many of the traditional concepts of contract law, such as offer and acceptance, consideration, privity, etc., continue to apply and are still appropriate. Nevertheless, contracts between suppliers of information handling equipment and services and users pose some special challenges, whether you act for the supplier or the user. And the first challenge is to clearly state the intent or purpose of the contract. This is not so much a problem of law as a matter of negotiation. I remind you again that information handling involves some kind of an integrated systems approach and that many systems involve several components and many different suppliers. Unfortunately, very often the user, particularly the relatively inexperienced user, thinks he is entering into a systems contract, or as we sometimes call them, a results-oriented contract, whereas the supplier is only intending to contract to supply some component of the system. The supplier is well aware that the system will be made up of many parts from several sources and he is unwilling to take full systems performance responsibility. Moreover, in many situations, the user has the most knowledge about his information requirements, the volumes of data he will be dealing with, his future plans and intentions with respect to his information handling needs. Also, the user will be the one who operates the system controls the accuracy of the input data, formats the output data, decides upon the checks and balances and the audit trails, etc. And so, in most instances, the suppliers are extremely reluctant to enter into these results-oriented contracts. Rather, they contract to deliver a particular piece of hardware or software according to certain specifications and warrant their product will perform to those specifications. They are unwilling, in most cases, to give any performance warranties, and they usually disclaim any warranties or conditions that the product is fit for any particular purpose. Furthermore, the supplier often insists that the user's responsibilities be fully set out so as to reduce any misunderstanding as to where the line is to be drawn between the supplier's responsibilities and the user's responsibilities. Therefore, whether acting for a supplier or a user, you should make certain your client understands the intent and purpose of the contract and also make certain that the words of the contract or contracts, since there can be several covering one system, fully reflect this understanding. If the system involves several components and if the supplier or suppliers are unwilling to take systems responsibility, but the user does want someone to be responsible for the whole system, he may find it necessary to enter into an umbrella contract with a consulting firm specializing in systems integration. These organizations operate more like general contractors and provide a turnkey service for the ultimate user. However, it's not enough to focus on intent and purpose. It's also necessary to focus on what will constitute a breach and it's often necessary to assess this in order to properly draft your intent and purpose clauses. Indeed, it's at this point that we begin to touch upon some of the public policy concerns which I mentioned. As I've stated, systems fail, 
components have intermittent faults, there are hydro failures and communication outages, and finally, programming is not an exact science. Accordingly, whether supplying components or a full systems approach, suppliers, as I've said, are not only unusually unwilling to guarantee performance, they will hardly, if at all, guarantee perfect performance. So if representing a supplier, you should be aware of this, and if acting for a user, you should make certain your client understands what failures or malfunctions would fall short of a breach of contract. And that can often be a very difficult discussion and a very difficult line to draw. To draw. Now, in any event, assuming that the scope has been adequately drafted and it's possible to establish that there has been a breach and it can be proved who caused the breach, it's extremely important to focus on the damages which may flow and the damages which may be recoverable. In my experience, this is often the most troublesome clause of all to negotiate. It's also an area where the current state of the law poses several uncertainties, primarily for the supplier, but also for the buyer. As I've said, the potential for substantial damages can be very great. Secondly, and this is very important, in the course of marketing equipment or services, the supplier of necessity becomes very knowledgeable about the customer's intended application plans, etc., and therefore acquires considerable knowledge of the damages which can flow from any breach of the contract. And finally, when there is a failure, the repairs covered by the warranty clauses are usually a very minor part of the damage. The major damage is usually the consequential economic loss which results from the system becoming inoperable. And since, according to current jurisprudence, the customer is entitled to recover damages which would flow in the usual course of things from the breach, or for the consequences of the breach which might reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of the parties at the time they made the contract, the supplier, understandably, is very nervous about his liability for damages. On the other hand, the buyer knows he faces some probability of suffering damages and he wants recourse. Therefore, it's easy to see why the question of liability for damages can become a classic struggle between the buyer and the seller. Nevertheless, for the reasons stated, suppliers of information handling systems or the components of such systems traditionally attempt to limit their liability for damages in these contracts. And I should emphasize that these clauses usually are an attempt to limit liability as opposed to excluding liability. Therefore, many suppliers, including my own company, accept the principle that they should provide some reasonable compensation to a customer who has suffered damage, but they must protect themselves against large damages arising from indirect or consequential loss. Accordingly, many suppliers have standard clauses which purport to limit their liability for direct or to limit their liability to direct damages, or in some cases provide for an upper limit on the amount of direct damages, but which at the same time attempt to exclude liability for all indirect or consequential damages, including lost profits, lost savings, etc. Now there's one other aspect of damages which is of considerable importance when talking about information handling systems. And I'm referring to damages which result from a fundamental breach of a contract. And this is a subject which has been the matter of considerable debate and judicial interpretation in recent years. And as you know, recent cases have established once more that it is not a rule of law, but rather a rule of construction. Hence, it is possible to construct a clause which does exclude liability for damages resulting from a breach of a fundamental term of a contract. As I stated earlier, the technology has advanced and continues to advance at a very rapid pace. And in many situations, information systems are pushing the state of the art of the technology. And this is true whether you're talking about brand new systems or incremental additions to existing systems. Frequently, there is a risk that the system will not perform the function expected. 
In other words, there will be a total failure to accomplish what was contemplated by the contract and hence a fundamental breach of the contract. And this is a risk suppliers are very concerned about. And so again, many suppliers include language in their contracts which attempts to limit their liability for damages arising from fundamental breach, in addition to limiting their liability for damages from other kinds of breaches. These clauses specifically address failure to perform a fundamental term, and the contracts also often contain upfront language which recognizes the possibility that there can be a fundamental breach. I should add that the clauses which purport to limit a supplier's liability either for ordinary breach or fundamental breach are largely untested. Therefore, it remains to be seen how the courts will choose to interpret these clauses. Nevertheless, I submit there are some difficult public policy questions which the courts will need to consider given the tendency of the courts to on occasion strike down these limitation clauses. Now, very quickly, before leaving contracts, I'd like to take a moment or two to consider the contractual implications with respect to software. Briefly, software in the computer business is used mainly to refer to computer programs, the instructions written by a programmer and converted into machine-readable form. And machine-readable form means the instructions are coded as sequences of positive or negative electrical impulses and when not being actively exercised within a computer, reside on some physical media, such as a tape or a disk. And when needed, the electrical impulses are transmitted from their storage media into the computer. And once they've been in, uh, fed into the computer, the tape or disk can be erased. And if you need to store the impulses later on, they can be transmitted to some other tape or disk until needed. Indeed, today, you do not even need any tangible media such as tapes or disks for programs. These programs can be loaded into one computer from another computer at some other location by means of communication lines and satellite signals. So, computer programming uh, does exist independently of any particular media. And therefore, software is intangible in every sense of the word. And the characteristics I've just referred to have presented some rather difficult questions for owners of programs who are trying to protect their investment, who are trying to protect their ownership rights. Because in Canada, it's certainly the better opinion that computer programs are not protected by the law of copyright. And so since there is no good existing system which adequately protects a programmer's investment, the most commonly used vehicle is the license agreement. And under these agreements, the licensor, the programmer, retains ownership and merely gives the licensee the right to use the program, either for a specified period of time or for an indefinite period upon payment of a license fee. However, the licensor also wants to maximize his ability to market as many licenses as possible. That's how he gets his return for his labors. Accordingly, these agreements normally contain clauses which restrict the use of the program to specified computers and also limit the number of copies that can be made of the program. And in large measure, these clauses presume good faith on the part of the licensee since they are very difficult to police. Now, I don't want to imply that all programs are licensed. If somebody engages a programmer to write a custom-made kind of program and the uh, user or the buyer is willing to pay the full cost of all of that activity, uh, he would also, in those cases, be able to buy the full right title and interest in the program as opposed to getting a license. So now I'd like to turn to the subject of torts. As I indicated earlier, when information systems fail, there is potential for very large damages and affecting many, many individuals and organizations. And moreover, since these systems seldom cause property damage or physical injury, 
the resulting damages are invariably purely economic. And until recently, our courts were unwilling to recognize tort claims where the loss or damage was purely economic. Although for some time past, they have allowed damages for economic loss in situations where the claimant had also suffered some property damage or physical injury which triggered economic loss. Nevertheless, in recent years, there has been a line of cases where the courts have allowed tort claims and awarded damages in situations where there has been no property damage or physical injury and where the loss was solely economic. I'm referring, of course, to the Headley Byrne case and the numerous cases which have followed in which the courts have imposed tort liability for negligent statements, as well as the Rivto Marine versus Washington Ironworks case in which the court imposed liability on the defendants for failure to warn the plaintiff of a known defect. In all cases, there was no property damage or physical injury, but notwithstanding, the courts concluded the plaintiff should be recompensed for his economic loss. Now, it remains to be seen how far the courts are prepared to go in extending this concept. Clearly, there are many jurists who have expressed reservations as to how far the concept should be taken. And there are also many jurists who are concerned about the public policy implications of extending this concept. For example, in 1970, Lord Justice Denning stated, in actions of negligence, when the plaintiff has suffered no damage to his person or property, but has only sustained economic loss, the law does not usually permit him to recover that loss. The reason, he said, lies in public policy. But as Professor Linden stated in his book on Canadian tort law, these public policy factors, quote, have not prevented the courts from gradually moving to provide protection when they felt there was a sufficient guarantee that the liability could be controlled and would not get out of hand. So it's difficult to predict how far the, car the courts will go in establishing a duty of care which would set the stage for more and more plaintiffs to recover pure economic loss. However, in my view, that is not the end of the public policy concern or the public policy debate. If the courts should see fit to establish a duty of care, which potentially opens the door to more and more claims for economic loss, what will be the standard of care required of a defendant and when will he be held to be in breach of that standard of care? Clearly, one approach is to rely on the traditional concept of negligence and to only allow recovery when negligence can be established. In cases involving economic loss flowing from the failure of an information handling system, a standard of care based on negligence would certainly work in favor of the defendant in the vast majority of cases. Most failures are not due to negligence. As I've stated earlier it's, earlier, it's a failure of design, an error in the program, which is not a science, uh, interruptions in the power supply, etc. And secondly, as I've indicated, it's also often impossible after the event to accurately determine the cause of the failure, particularly in those situations where the failure is an intermittent one. On the other hand, if the court should conclude that the defendant's standard of care should be more onerous, I for one submit it would be wrong to impose strict liability on operators or suppliers of these information handling systems. In my view, the concept of strict liability should not be applied to relationships where the potential for the loss is purely economic. We are not dealing with things which are dangerous in themselves. Moreover, the court should not place an undue burden on business and other institutions such that they could be held liable for economic loss resulting merely from substandard conduct. Now finally, even if the courts are able to formulate a duty of care and a standard of care which are acceptable and workable in a public policy sense, there remains the whole question of damages. As I've stated several times, the damages arising from the failure of these systems can be very large and in a tort sense there can be many, many potential claimants. And in many instances the exposure for damages would be completely out of proportion to any possible return for the defendant who is operating the information system. 
And finally, in many cases, literally, the amount of damages could be so great that they would virtually bankrupt most organizations and hence deprive the claimants of any recovery in any event. So certainly, once you begin to conceive of damages in these terms, it is clear there are several major public policy issues which will have to be resolved. How should the risk be allocated? Should the operators and suppliers of these systems be put in the position of insurers? These questions will have to be answered. Nevertheless, it's my opinion that because of the proliferation of information handling systems and the growing potential for substantial economic losses associated with the use of these systems, the courts will be under increasing pressure to expand the scope and thrust of our tort laws as we know them today. And I view this as just one more consequence of the information age, but a consequence which may very well reshape a very important segment of our whole legal system. Finally, I would like to spend just a brief moment or two on the subject of evidence. Clearly, our evidence laws were not written with automated information handling systems in mind. And there is a growing consensus that our evidence laws are quite inappropriate to efficiently cope with computer evidence. As you are well aware, our evidence laws do provide for the admissibility of records made in the usual and ordinary course of business. However, these laws also provide that the courts are entitled to require evidence as to the circumstances in which the information contained in the record was written, recorded, stored, reproduced, etc., in order to decide upon its admissibility or to determine its probative value. Therefore, the courts can and do require the party introducing computer records to also introduce evidence to establish a foundation for its admissibility. And this is understandable because the do these documents, and in many cases the data which forms the basis for the documents, are created by an automated process which takes place entirely within a machine with no human observation, supervision, or intervention. And while the analogy is not perfect in all respects, the problem is not unlike the problem the courts faced with photography. And the courts have been uncertain as to how much preliminary evidence should be adduced and what form that evidence should take to establish that the computer record is an accurate and reliable depiction of the data in the computer and that there has been no tampering with or alteration of the record. Accordingly, judges have taken varying approaches to cope with the problem, and it seems to be one of those problems everyone is trying to ignore, hoping somehow it will go away. However, there is one case which does address the problem squarely, while at the same time creating cause for concern. In the case of Regina versus McMullen, the Ontario Court of Appeal did hold that certain computerized banking records, which fell within the ambit of Section 29 of the Canada Evidence Act, could be admitted in evidence as prima facie proof of the transactions recorded thereon as provided for in that section. But the Court of Appeal went on to say that the trial judge should carefully scrutinize the foundation put before him to support a finding of reliability as a condition of admissibility. The court also allowed that this issue is much more complex than that of proving reliability of evidence of records kept in more traditional forms. Since this was a case involving admissibility of records of a financial institution under Section 29, the court concluded the trial judge must satisfy himself on the four conditions precedent set out in Section 29.2, namely that a record at the time of making the entry was one of the ordinary records of the institution, that the entry was made in the usual and ordinary course of business, that the record is in the custody or control of the institution, and that such copy is a true copy thereof. As well, other foundation criteria for business and banking records have been established by the courts in respect of Section 30 of the Canada Evidence Act and other evidence act. These include such criteria that the record has been prepared contemporaneously with, or at least reasonably close to the events they refer to, 
that there was some duty to record and supply the information recorded and so on. And time does not permit me to take each criterion and assess it against the way in which data processing systems are instructed and operated and managed, but I can assure you that when you do try to match up the criteria against the day-to-day -day operation of a modern information handling system, you will often find there is a significant problem in measuring up to the criteria, particularly if the judge is unwilling to exercise considerable discretion. Now, there are attempts underway to make changes. For example, the United Kingdom amended its Evidence Act in 1968, and the Evidence Act in South Australia was amended in 1976. Both these statutes now specifically establish separate admissibility criteria for computer printouts. And if the printout complies with certain stated conditions, it's admissible as evidence of any fact stated thereon. Even so, Valuable as these changes are, they have not overcome all the problems. In the English Act, for instance, they keep talking about activities regularly carried on in the computer, and that's great when you're talking about repetitive things such as payrolls and inventory controls, but it does not, in my view, take into account the one-of-a-kind inquiry that has become such a standard part of the use of data processing systems today, and therefore while there have been no cases yet under this section, it does remain to see how the courts will choose to terp interpret the language in those sections. In Canada, a task force under the auspices of the Uniform Law Conference of Canada has been working on a new model Uniform Evidence Act. In the latest draft, there are several sections dealing with business and government records. However, unlike the revised English and South Australian Acts, there is no section or for that matter, any language which deals specifically with computer evidence. Accordingly, the Draft Act does not set out any unique foundation conditions for the admissibility of computer records. Rather, the draft allows the courts to inquire into the circumstances in which the record, the information in the record was written, recorded, etc., and thus retains the very same concept which appears in the current Canada Evidence Act. So accordingly, if this draft act should be adopted, it would appear that we'll be left in the same position we are in today, and it will be up to the courts to enunciate the foundation rules. And this is unfortunate given the fact that increasing quantities of information and business data will be resident in automated information handling systems, and hence computer evidence will undoubtedly become more prevalent. It's my view that further thought should be given to establishing more specific foundation criteria for computer evidence, and that this criteria should recognize that computer evidence, or more accurately, information and data residing inside a computer, and the manner in which this information and data is created into a record, differ dramatically from the traditional concept of records as we know them. So this is another example of where the combination of the information age and the technology of information handling are to a large extent not easily accommodated by current jurisprudence. So I hope I've demonstrated this morning that there are many difficult questions which will have to be addressed. And the questions I've raised this morning, provocative though they may be, are just the tip of the iceberg. When you consider some of the new technologies and data processing applications which are already coming down the pike, robotics, video tech services, electronic mail and electronic payment systems, for example, it's clear that the legal dimensions of the information age will become even more complex. Each one of these developments will have a major impact on our jurisprudence. And for the lawyer who's dealing with these problems, there will be no shortage of challenges. Indeed, our profession will have to play a key role if our legal system is to accommodate the information age and the new technologies in a way which provides maximum benefits to our society as a whole. Thank you.